This conference will now be recorded. Good evening and welcome to the Green Bay School Board Virtual Candidate Forum hosted by the League of Women Voters of Greater Green Bay. My name is Karen Schley and it has been my pleasure to coordinate this event. On behalf of the League, I would like to thank the candidates for participating in this forum. Incumbent Andrew Becker and Rhonda Sindikoff and challengers Brian Mills and Nancy Welch. The four candidates are running for two open seats on the Green Bay School Board. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it necessary to hold forums with no live audience. Going forward, in order to allow the voters to meet the candidates and become more educated about the important issues in upcoming elections, forums will need to be handled in this manner at least for the time being. The general spring election is Tuesday, April 6th. Because of the current pandemic, absentee voting or vote, vote by mail has become very popular. We wanted to hold this forum and other forums early to enable the voters to make informed choices. With the different devices individuals are using to join us, some squares or windows may um, be larger. This is not intended to favor any one candidate. Folks in the audience may improve their viewing experience by selecting view active cameras at the top of their screen. Each candidate will be given two minutes to make an opening statement. Next, the questions will rotate between the candidates with each being given a one minute and 30 second opportunity to answer the questions. In closing, each candidate will be given two minutes to make final remarks. There will be no rebuttal. Questions have been gathered ahead of time and sorted for duplication. Viewers can still submit questions to the candidates during the forum. Remember the questions must, must be questions that all candidates can answer and they need to be appropriate and pertaining to the issues. The email address is lwbggbforums20 at gmail.com. This address will appear on the screen during the forum. The Green Bay School Board Virtual Candidate Forum will be on our Facebook page as well as our website and YouTube. The League of Women Voters of the United States recommends that all candidate forums fall within the FCC regulations and will only allow audio video to be broadcast in its entirety, except for the media covering the event. Before we start, I would like to thank the many league members who helped to make this candidate forum possible, especially Steve Harrell, a league member who has stepped up to help us in the technology needed. <clears throat> the league moderator this evening is Jean Marsh. Jean is an active league member on the Green Bay, on the League of Women Voters um, Board, past president of the Green Bay School Board, and is the chairman of the League of Women Voters Healthcare Committee. Enjoy the forum this evening and remember that it is very important to vote. Thank you, Karen. And welcome to our candidates, Andrew Becker, Brian Mills, Rhonda Sindical, and Nancy Welch. And welcome to our virtual audience watching from the safety of your home. Thank you for taking time to attend this forum to become informed about this election. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan pol political organization encouraging the informed and active participation of citizens in government. It influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League never supports or opposes any political party or candidate. As Karen stated, questions have been submitted in advance and we also welcome questions from our audience during this program. League member Gail Hohenstein will review and send questions to me so that I can present them to the candidates. The timekeeper for this forum is League member Don Dahlstrom. With this being a virtual forum, the candidate who begins selected a number closest to a predetermined number, and I will alternate each subsequent question between candidates 
so each candidate has the opportunity to respond first. The forum will run for one hour and 30 minutes. We will begin with Rhonda Sidnikow with her opening statement. Rhonda? Thanks, Jean. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Also, thanks to those of you who've tuned in and are invested in this very important school board election. I'm Rhonda Sitnikow and I've been serving on the Green Bay Area Public School Board of Education for a little over three years. I'm a self-employed, single parent, community advocate, and volunteer. I'm running for re-election to ensure that the community continues to have a voice at the school board table. I've lived and breathed community advocacy for years. Some of the issues that I have advocated on include homelessness, food insecurity, and housing equity. It was during this work that I realized how a thriving public school system can be a game changer and deal breaker for the community that it serves. We know the future of public education is constantly on shaky ground. And as publicly elected board members, I believe it's our duty to do the sometimes difficult work of holding our districts accountable. It's also time for us to reimagine what public education will look like for ge future generations. I'm 100% committed to reevaluating the system to make sure that it is serving the people it is intended to. School district budgets that are very top heavy with administration while leaving teachers to raise money for their classrooms, supplies, is one example of something that needs to be reexamined. We can and must do better than this. I look forward to the discussion tonight. And again, thank you for having me here. Andrew? Uh You'd go next with your opening comments. Thank you, and also thank you to the League for hosting this forum. It's uh, certainly a, a challenging way to have to do it. I miss the, um, as we all do, miss the friendly confines of the library auditorium. I go way back to uh, going to some of those things, and by that I mean even before I ran for, for the board. Um, I'm running for re-election to the board because I think I, there's some work that needs to still be done. Uh, and we kind of had everything on pause with COVID for a long time now. Uh, I would like to see us continue working on some issues that I've advocated for like class size. And that means class size with real class size rules, not guidelines. I also want to stress hands-on leadership and the importance of board members advocating for ideas and not being afraid to have a vote and uh, have the vote go up or down and direct administration to follow uh, what the board is looking for. I have two kids in the district. Isaiah is an eighth grader. Noah is a senior. Uh, Green Bay District was wonderful to me. It's been wonderful to my kids. I look forward to speaking more with uh, my fellow candidates tonight and finding out what um, what important things we probably have in common and also some important things that, that make our candidacies different. Thank you again to the League and I look forward to the rest of the evening. Brian, if you would offer your opening comments. Thank you. Uh, just like the other two candidates stated so far, and I'm sure Nancy will, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight and for all the community members that are taking their time out of their schedule to learn more about the candidates that are running for the Board of Education. My name is Brian Mills, and I'm proud to be running for the Green Bay Area Public School Board. I spent my entire career working to improve public education and to ensure that all students have access to great public schools. I'm currently a middle school special education teacher in a neighboring district, and I help students make positive choices both in school and, their com and in their community, and I've worked there for five years. Prior to this, I was a special education teacher at Washington Middle School, working for 13 years with students that receive special education services in a variety of areas, but primarily to improve their behavior and emotional skills. I also officiate football and basketball throughout Brown County, and I coordinate football officials for the Green Bay Officials Association for all of the Green Bay schools, as well as uh, the suburban schools in the area. If you've attended a football game or a basketball game at any of the Green Bay Middle Schools the last five years, there's a good chance I've officiated it. And I hope that you agreed with my calls, and if not, that doesn't impact your vote. I also serve as our district's uh, gifted and talented coordinator for our CESA GT Consortium, which provides opportunities for students 
um, to further their educational experiences. And it also gives me the opportunity to collaborate with educators throughout the region on what's working in education and what we need to improve on. I also serve as our district's nonviolent crisis intervention trainer, where I train other staff members on how to respond when students are in crisis. I'm a currently a member of the New York Times Learning Network Teaching Project with 60 other educators that gives me the opportunity to um, collaborate. And most importantly, I'm proud to be a resident in Green Bay and to have my children attend school in the Green Bay School District. Thank you. Nancy, if you would offer your opening comments. Good evening. Thank you to the League for organizing this forum and to my fellow candidates for participating. My name is Nancy Welch and I am a lifelong resident of Green Bay and a product of the Green Bay Schools. I earned two degrees from UW Oshkosh, a Bachelor of Science in Special Ed and a Master's degree in Regular Education. I have also earned 36 credits of continuing education and have attended numerous district, district training sessions and conferences. These range from critical issues such as diversity training and crisis intervention to teaching poetry in the classroom. With my two degrees, I have taught kindergarten through 12th graders during my more than 40 years in the classroom. In addition, I have tutored many local students and served as a substitute teacher. I taught in the GED Fast Track program at NWTC and until COVID at Literacy Green Bay. Teaching students from many countries, cultures, and socioeconomic backgrounds has been a privilege and has simply reinforced my belief in the promise of education and the joy of learning. The Board of Education is in the business of educating, and if there's anything I know after a lifetime of teaching, it is that all students can learn, and it is our job to make that happen. Over the next very challenging year, we will be making decisions that will impact how we teach and care for our students, families, and staff for years to come. Their voices must be front and center in this discussion, and I believe my passion and experience will allow me to amplify that. Let's inspire a joy of learning as we make this transition. Thank you. Thank you all for your opening comments. The, next, the first question, uh, we will start with uh, Andrew Becker, and it is a three-part question. What do you see as the major issue or issues facing your school district? What are the greatest challenges? And how does or should the board decide on what is most important? Okay, thank you very much. Hang on, um, hang on a second, I got a technical problem here. Okay. So, sorry about that. Hmm. Sorry about that. No problem. My unit, went to, my unit went to double screen here. Yeah, it's squared away. Okay. We want to start the the question will be um, one and a half minutes, Correct. so we want to wait till Don can get the Timer that number up on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Oh. oh. Power. Okay. All right, Don. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Yep. For waiting. Okay. So, all right, so I get to go first with a three-part question in a minute and a half, so that is that is challenging. So, I, and I have to split the first answer into two parts because I think the biggest issue right now, obviously, is a safe reopening um, and transition back to in-person learning with COVID-19. I think the ongoing, uh, the ongoing issue that's most important, I believe, is addressing class size and having the right class sizes so our kids can can learn in an uncrowded environment and get the right teacher attention that they need. I think the the challenges is are certainly you know dealing with COVID and managing that right uh, that right balance of of COVID safety and the also important need for getting kids into the classroom. As far as what the board can do, I believe the board needs to take a, an active hands-on role in decision-making. The board needs to be 
uh, the board should have positions. The board should uh, should take votes. Uh, public needs to know where where board members stand and that the district is in um, in good hands with the board uh, and an administration led by the board to follow what the community is is looking for and to listen to the community. Uh, thank you. Brian, if you would please uh, take the question. Thank you. Uh, I believe that one of the biggest issues that the district's facing right now is making sure that we can close the achievement gap and ensure a quality public education for all the students in the district. Um, we have significant concerns as far as uh, closing that gap and the approach that we're going to need to take as a board and as a district is to make sure that we can include families and community members as stakeholders to uh, work together on that. Um, Education obviously is a it's a community event, and we need to make sure that we make our schools as open and welcoming to family members, community members, and that we welcome the students back with that. Um, the board can do that by promoting promoting our district and making sure that we have the highest quality educators in front of our students, and that our class sizes, as Andrew had mentioned as well, are not too high, and that our, our special education students are receiving the services that they need. Um, this is, can also be done by increasing public school funding, which the board can take a stand on to make sure that we are advocating for full funding of public education, both with a regular education student and special education students, and advocating for that at both a state and national level. So thank you. Okay, Nancy, if you would please respond to the question. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry. We Closing can't. the gap. Oh. We didn't. Uh, we we didn't hear the first part. Um, Don, would you be able to start oh. over? Oh. Okay, go. Cool. Okay, I think that. Um, Closing the, the gap, like Brian had said, is very important. And especially now with COVID, COVID has made the gap even worse than it was before. So what I feel we need to do is to really work hard together to make sure that we give the best product to everybody. And I think we have to start looking at our curriculum. I think we have to make sure that the universal curriculum is there, it's age appropriate, and that it allows teachers to have some flexibility to bring some joy into learning again. I also think we need to look at all of the testing that's being done to our students. We need to have less stress and more success in order for everybody to come to school and feel successful and to get the best education that they possibly can in Green Bay. And as a board member, I would love to, you know, start giving some ideas of my own about the universal um, curriculum and things like that that I've actually worked with. Okay, thank you. Okay. Rhonda, if you would please um, respond to the question. Um, would you mind repeating the, the three-part question again, Jean? Oh, certainly. Thank you. Um, what do you see as the major issue or issues facing your school district? What are the greatest challenges? And how should the board decide what is most important? Okay, thank you. Um, so I would agree with Andrew in saying that right now the biggest issue really revolves around um, the, the current teaching and learning format, bringing kids back into the buildings. Um, we know that three-fourths of our families have chosen to come back in person, while about a fourth of them are, are staying virtual. And that is something that we are currently experiencing right now, trying to address the needs of students um, considering the failing grades and the social emotional issues that have come about regarding um, the, the the virtual learning and the, the pandemic state in general um, so these are big challenges right um, challenges with this as well um, what are we going to do as far as addressing the needs moving forward and transitioning into next year um, i personally believe that a lot of this um, needs to be we need to be very intentional and focused on our budget and how it is going to um, play into support for the right the right areas and the right people involved and i believe that um, should be student-centered and classroom -centered. so supporting our students supporting our staff um, with 
whatever they need, um, maybe making some tough decisions on, along the way to ensure that this happens is something we need to um, bring out in the forefront and hopefully come together on. Okay, the next question will start with um, Brian. What is your view of the role of Green Bay Area Public Schools in dealing with the external, that is the non-school issues, impacting the educational progress of lower income, largely minority students? I believe that the uh, school district has a great responsibility to work to ensure that all of these students are able to achieve what we need them to. Uh, one thing that I've advocated was embracing the community school model, which uh, has six key points to it. Uh, the first one is to make sure that we offer a curriculum that is strong and it's proven as culturally relevant, so the students are engaged with the program and engaged in school. The other one is making sure that we have high quality teaching and learning taking place that's asking for um, deeper skills and making sure that the critical thinking skills are there and allowing teachers to focus on what their building finds as relevant and um, important for their students to learn. We need to make sure that we have inclusive leadership so that we have teachers and administration making decisions that impact the building and in, in a sense with that, the community that's around them. We need to make sure that we have positive behavior practices, including restorative justice, that reflects the community that the students are in and their family members. And we need to make sure that we can stress a community and family partnership so we can provide the resources that families going, are going to need to help their students learn and achieve their education. The, the families are a key part of their education. And then we also need to make sure we have coordinated and integrated wraparound services. So um, mental health issues, physical health issues, and child care can be addressed as well. So thank you. Thank you. Nancy, if you'd please take the question. And Jean, could you please repeat it? Certainly. What is your view of the role of Green Bay Area Public Schools in dealing with the external, that is the non-school issues, impacting the educational progress of lower income, largely minority students. Okay. The thing is, is that the externals like um, the homelessness, the poverty, the things like that, those are all things that the school has addressed in many ways, you know, like feeding them at school, Sometimes you give them clothes at school, they're social workers, they're psychologists, we, we do a lot of things like that. And we always have to reach out to families, we have to make sure that everybody, they understand where to go for services and things like that. But the key thing here is that if you have the proper school environment for these children, they can learn. They are remarkable, they are resilient, they can do this. You cannot frustrate them. You have to make school the place they want to be. Stopping the testing. Give the teachers tools that are consistent throughout the school so that if they move from one school to another school, they know where they're at. They know that they were halfway through the first book in reading. All of these things, are ways to make your education the best so that you can get all of these students learning. The things I've learned about um, working with children of poverty is that they can do it with the right education. Thank you. Rhonda, if you would please uh, take the question. And would you mind repeating it again? Sorry, Jean. Just No, certainly. What is your view of the role of Green Bay Area Public Schools in dealing with the external, that is the non-school issues impacting the educational progress of lower income, largely minority students. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would, I would speak to external issues come into the buildings with the students. Um, they're living and breathing what is going on outside of school. Um, they bring that into the buildings and we need to support them when, when they're in, in our care. And I would start with looking at um, even in, even just I guess outside of the district, looking at pu uh, public health, Brown County public health, partnering with with the system, looking to see what what can be done. Um, 
other municipalities, city, city council, city government, looking at uh, housing. Um, are we are we providing you know equitable housing opportunities, real and true affordable housing for our families? I think we have work to do there. Um, coming into um, school, uh, looking at um, our our board policies and practices. Are we in fact, culturally responsive and sensitive to their needs. Um, we need to really take a deep dive into that and, and decide what we need to be working on, um, especially when it comes to discipline policies, um, dress code policies, expulsions, um, and so forth. Uh, the board recently signed a uh, racism is a public health crisis resolution, which I was proud to um, sign on to, but to make sure that it has teeth when the students are in our care, we need to um, look at all of those things to address. I would also say the curriculum as well as the professional development to make sure our staff is also responsive to our students um, of color. The next question, we will start with uh, Nancy. What are your thoughts about vouchers, private school, tuition tax credits, and charter schools? Andrew still okay, needs to Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Andrew, if you'd take That's the okay. last. Sure. Do you need me to repeat okay. it? Yes, please. Okay. What is your view of the role of Green Bay Area Public Schools in dealing with the external non-school issues impacting the educational progress of lower income, largely minority students? Okay, I, I suppose perhaps um, perhaps accidentally skipping me because the other three candidates actually gave very good answers that probably covered a lot of the territory. I, um, I could see that happening. Um, what I would say is a couple of things. I mean, every, like I said, everything's, everything's correct. And, um, you know, Brian was correct about uh, communities, community schools model, and we absolutely should do, do more with that. Um, we do need to look at disproportionality. Um, uh, one area that I worked on very early in my board term is reducing the expulsion rate. Um, I was instrumental in getting um, alternatives to expulsion, uh, alternative placements that got expulsions reduced by over 70%, and that was a very disproportionate, it affected um, affect populations much worse. One thing I think we need to look at in specific is there's been a lot of back and forth about what is the best practices for our English language learners. Um, we had I had a range of different different answers I've gotten over the past year or two about how are we how are we able to get students who uh, come speaking another language uh, at what's the right pace to transition them to English and I think that's been that has been done without teacher input sometimes and I've gotten some mixed answers on that and that's an issue to look into for sure for that um, equity issue. Thank you. Then the next question will start with Nancy. Uh, I'll repeat that. What are your thoughts about vouchers, private school tuition tax credits, and charter schools? As mostly a public school teacher for 40 years, you know, I feel all education is very important and it has to be funded. But my major thing about being a public education teacher is that we take all children and we have to educate all children we don't get to pick and choose and therefore i i feel like i really like the the public dollars to go to the public schools um vouchers is a real challenge like in the bigger districts like milwaukee and kenosha i, I feel we have, have some of that but it's not to the extent that um, you know we lose dollars other ways. So I think the voucher thing is something to be to be mindful of. But I also think that um, public schools need to be funded with our public money. Thank you, Rhonda. If you would respond to the question, please. I'm um, sure. Uh, so with. Regards to privatization, and that's basically what I, I believe the question you know is revolving around. Um, as a board member, we signed on, I believe it was two years ago, uh, to a resolution that asked for public public schools and private schools to be held to 
the same standard as far as even just what goes on your tax bill, like your property tax bill. Um, the expenditures, the allocation is, is there for public schools, but it is not there for private schools. And um, if they're going to to use uh, property or sorry, um, taxpayer dollars, or they should actually be able to, people should be able to see what, what is going out the door for that. Um, lining up with public schools, they should also be as far as regulation and requirements for, um, you know, you look at the school report card, you look at other uh, requirements, regulations when it comes to um, what public schools have to, I guess, hit the mark on. Um, Again, if they're going to take property tax dollars, they need to be able to be held accountable in the same way that public schools are in, in, in regards to regulation and requirements. Um, uh, touching on the special education students as well, um, that is something that if you're a special education parent, you have a hard time if you want to go into a private school setting, um, you, you don't necessarily have to be taken. Um, so, And that's unfortunate. The customer service is what will keep our families from choosing to go to these private schools, and that is something that we need to be proactive on. Andrew, if you would respond to the question, please. So I think um, if if you check a little deeper into the numbers, actually the the voucher the voucher impact on Green Bay is becoming uh, more and more serious. And one um, one very insidious thing about it is that it is a direct impact to the taxpayer so for those who are thinking well maybe it's you know maybe it's fair maybe it's balanced somehow this is the one thing that that uh there's no there's no state percentage of it it's separate money that comes you know it's going to go directly out of the out of the taxpayer's pocket and people need to be aware of that voucher schools though, though there may have been some small changes in the in the rules they they can kick kids out when they want uh, if they kick a kid out after they've been counted as after the third Friday, uh, that district is going that voucher school is gonna get to keep that money, and people need to be aware of that. It's not it's not apples to apples. It's not a fair situation. It comes straight out of the taxpayers, and it's it's not it's simply not providing an equitable education. There are not the same standards. Um, you know, people have said, well, what if would it be okay if they were you know, all the standards were the same, to which I would say, I would think very few places taking vouchers if they had to have state certified teachers, if they had to take special ed students, if they had to follow all the rules and follow all the same testing, I'm not sure they would want it. They might want to just stay independent. Okay, Brian, if you would respond to the question, please. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm against vouchers. I think that there's a place for private schools, and if, if students want to attend a private school, then that's that's fine. Um, as has been mentioned before, vouchers are a, a double, we're funding two school systems in the state by having these two different systems. And the other thing that the voucher schools have is they, they take a first draw on the public funds, which is a, a big concern. So the charter, I'm sorry, the, public, the voucher schools get funding before the public schools get funding. It's the accounting measure with it. Um, I think voucher schools and school vouchers, it's a civil rights violation for staff members. They don't have the same protection, but also for special education students. Uh, if you have an IEP, a voucher school does not need to follow the IEP. They can, but they don't need to. Um, there's concerns with data reporting that had been mentioned before, uh, open meeting violations. Um, I do support publicly Chart, I'm sorry, instrumentally chartered public schools, though. I disagree with non-instrumentality charter schools, which are chartered by someone other than the school district, but the charter schools that are instrumentality of the school district, I support. I also have major concerns with open enrollment, where students can leave the Green Bay School District and that money goes to other public schools in the area or anywhere in the state. And I think that's another huge concern that we need to address. That greatly fund school districts throughout the state. The next question, we'll start with Rhonda. What is the board's role in ensuring that our district has a well-qualified teaching staff, and what can the district do to attract and retain quality teachers? Oh, thank you. Um, First, I would start with, and it's been mentioned before, class sizes. This is something that, as a board member, I've heard about the entire time I've been there. 
Um, I have brought this forward a few times. Um, for some reason, the district administration um, tends to table it. We'll come back to it. Um, not too long ago, uh, we actually had a board meeting where Andrew proposed a class size cap, and um, I explained as well my support for it and the reasons behind that. And we are still waiting to have that discussion, um, hopefully sooner than later. Um, so the class size is a, is a big thing that I continue to hear about. I also hear about uh, the flexibility and the personal innovation that they are not allowed to, to bring into um, the conversation when it comes to teaching and learning. And that is something that um, they continue to talk about being hamstrung on. Um, reducing the layers of administration, bureaucracy when they need answers and they need um, solutions, um, they speak to that as well. And uh, reducing that so that they can actually, you know, in a timely fashion, get, get what they need in order to move forward because, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of time um, teachers have during the day for this and if they have a, a big job ahead of them. So these are things that I continue to hear as a board member. Um, I believe uh, the teacher voice in the decisions we make is important and we should continue to ask for that as well. Andrew, if you could please take the question. Yes, thank you. I think uh, to retain, retain a strong teaching staff, uh, certainly Remaining competitive on pay and benefits is important. I think we've we've done that. I was uh, directly involved in helping make sure that benefits stayed uh, stayed competitive and stayed stayed fair with a counter proposal that I made that I think leveled off the the playing field for benefits a little bit. Um, we need to make sure yes, class size is is very important. If if the money is close and maybe even if the money isn't close, if you are going to have multiple class sections in a middle school over 30 you i would think it would be more desirable to take a little less money to have sections of 24 and 24 and 25. Uh, my class size proposal is um, has actual board involvement not head nodding not consensus not uh we're going to try our best it would actually require the board to vote to exceed a class size cap if if that happened now Sometimes the board would do that. Sometimes I would do that. Sometimes it's necessary. But I think real meaningful class size uh, reform is probably the next most important thing other than keeping the pay and benefits competitive, which we, which we are doing. We need to make teachers feel welcome and we absolutely do need to involve teachers meaningfully, not just lip service, but meaningfully in decision-making process and teachers of a wide range of opinions need to be allowed at that table. Okay. Brian, if you would please take the question. Yes, uh, in order to attract and keep high quality teachers, um, you wanna make sure that the school district that you're working for is treating you with respect and that teachers have a voice. Um, since 1994, there's been limits as far as what teachers can be compensated, whether through the Qualified Economic Offer or since Act 10, that the, the financial part of it um, has been limited. Um, you need to make sure though that the teachers can still continue to have a voice at the table um, on all of the things that have been mentioned as far as class sizes, as far as uh, working conditions, as far as making sure that you're in a safe environment where communication has taken place. And that's that's regardless of whether there's a pandemic going on or um, just these normal issues that come up in the school. We also need to make sure that you can promote within. So we are preparing teachers to take leadership roles within the school district. The other thing is, while there are cap limits, we need to support them financially and make sure that we are getting the teachers to stay within. Um, voting against a 2% pay raise does not say come work with us. Treating them disrespectfully does not say come work with us and not promoting from within does not say come work with us. And if a teacher does decide to leave, there should be a policy that there's an exit interview that takes place so we can find out why this talent is leaving the door. So thank you. Nancy, if you would please re take the question. Hey, everybody had some really good answers. I say pay them, listen to them, and respect them. Then you will retain them. Thank you. Okay. The next question, um, we'll start with Andrew. 
Do you believe it was a good decision to reopen the schools to in-person learning? Thank you. Um, so I made my vote to uh, gradually reopen schools to in-person learning with the March 1st and March 8th start dates. Um, I voted yes. I stand by my vote. I would not have voted that way if I didn't think we could reopen safely. Um, I was, as I promised, I was at a school on day one, though I had requests of buildings. I visited outdoors that day on uh, one week later, uh, which is uh, Monday. Uh, yesterday, I did visit. Um, I did visit Preble High School and was um, was there, and I think it's it's going great. People were following procedures, and it was uh, it was safe. We continue to watch COVID numbers, and as COVID numbers continue to decline, I think we are getting to the point of serious discussion of returning to four days a week in the secondary school. I think some people misunderstood the yesterday's discussion as perhaps we were going to do it tomorrow or something we're not but we have to give some lead time in their spring spring break in there so we need to get that planning um i was disappointed that there was reluctance uh, and actually my motion to make it official that there's a meeting in two weeks to discuss this um failed because people didn't want to be seen as telling the administration what to do although the result will be exactly the same um, but I, yes, I do think we can do this right and do this safely. Okay. Brian, if you would please respond. I supported the decision that the school district had on two votes before that passed the board six to one to ensure that uh, teachers had the opportunity to receive the vaccination before schools opened. Um, I have a concern with the changing, I don't want to say the goalpost changing as far as what the plan is, because there are significant impacts that take place with that besides just within the bill within the schools opening I, I support schools being open now that teachers are becoming vaccinated and the, the numbers are declining but when the board has changed the opening dates to gain basically two to three days of in-class instruction when you look at how the calendar went that impacts not only the busing situation that impacts the city and crossing guard situations who is able to be crossing guards where I've heard that regular police officers had to be pulled off the street because of the shift of the dates on there, which is a huge cost to the taxpayers. That impacts the access to subs in the system. Um, the majority of the subs in the district, I believe, are retired teachers, and they're going to be more hesitant to come into that. Um, I have, I'm hoping that the district is visiting other schools to see how this happens, but when you're opening up schools, you can't necessarily compare it to neighboring districts because it is a large urban district that has 22,000 students. It's a slow moving ship and you have to make sure that you have all 40 buildings with a clear plan that indicates safe environments for the students, for the staff and for the community members on there. I supported it with the vaccines being available and I'm hoping that we can continue to move forward. Nancy, if you could please uh, respond. I watched all of this happening after I knew that I was going to be running for the school board and it and watching it kind of terrified me personally. Did we just get finished talking about how to retain teachers? Listen to teachers, respect them. I felt like there was so much disrespect that happened. It's like, well, you know, forget it. We said we were going to do this and now we're not going to. Do I take fault with the board for doing that? No, I mean, I think they, with the ever-changing stuff, I mean, the the COVID numbers, the, we're, this is good, this will work, you know, how can, it was an unsurmountable task to ask them, and I, I feel bad for the teachers, I feel bad for the whole situation, but could I have done a better job? I don't think so. I think they had, you know, good faith, they tried to do the best as they could for everybody involved. And it, it is a hard decision and it still is. And I just hope that, you know, as we're into it now, we continue to really keep check on it with the new variants and things like that. We have to just keep ahead of it the best we can. Thank you. Rhonda, if you would please uh, take the question. Thank you. Um, so um, Nancy touched on the fluid situation and, and yes, it has been the entire time, but what hasn't been fluid and what we know um, 
and what we and that's what I always spoke to is what do we know? We know that the failure rates had doubled, almost tripled with regards to our students. When we talk about achievement gaps, you you believe um, that those are real and, and then they're increasing. And a lot of that was happening because of the virtual, the all virtual uh, state that we were in. Uh, so we, we know these things, right? So then when we look at that, um, we also know that families were reaching out to us at astronomical numbers. We were hearing sometimes from 50 to 100 people a week about this. And they were discussing with us their, uh, their students were the apathy of school, the depression, the isolation, the suicidal ideation that was happening with their students. And this was a national problem, right? So we, we had studies to, to show that this was part of the issue. So we responded, we responded to our families. And now we have three fourths of our families in the buildings in some capacity. And so the school board responded the best that we could. And, and actually I'm pretty proud of the way that our board handled the, the conversation over the last eight, nine months was very complicated and stressful and a lot of moving parts and um, our charge though is to educate our students and I believe we are moving forward in that direction. Okay, thank you. The next question, uh, we'll start with Brian and it is related again to the pandemic. What should our school district be doing to ensure the safety of students and staff during this current pandemic? And are there specific precautions you would insist on to protect teachers, staff, and students, and to protect the spread of COVID-19? Yes, I. as far as policies and procedures within the school district, I think we need to make sure that we're giving it time to truly analyze how, um, how effective it is. And the good thing is that there's been opportunities to see how other school districts have done it. And we need to make sure that we're following through with keeping those policies strong. Mask wearing is a requirement and you need to make sure that students are wearing masks and washing their hands on a regular basis. We need to make sure that the physical layout of the building remains the same so you can have a safe passageway through the hall as far as having students moving in the same direction, that you can accurately contact trace, that we have a system set up that there is enough subs if you need to quarantine staff members or quarantine a classroom. Um, as far as making sure that the student, could you repeat the question, Gene? I'm just, I want to make sure I'm not missing one part on there. Sorry, and I'm watching the clock tick away. <laughs> That's okay, I'll get it. Um, what should our district be doing to ensure the safety of students and staff during the pandemic? And are there specific precautions you'd insist on to protect the teachers and staff and students? Yes. Um, so I'm glad I was hitting the answers uh, on that. Um, ensuring that we have contact tracing, making sure that we have staff members that are dedicated to that contact tracing, um, and that that is their sole job to focus on. I've I've been in schools where contact tracing can take up half of an administrator's day if one or two outbreaks happen in a classroom. So contact tracing, making sure that we're stressing the importance of it, and that we have safe classrooms and adequate um, precautions in place and a subsystem set up for if we need to quarantine classrooms and staff members. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Nancy, if you would please respond. Well, I think what we really have to do is carefully follow what the CDC says we need to do. And, and can we do that? We have to make sure. One thing I was really concerned about was like the ventilation thing that talking to somebody in maintenance, they said that the Green Bay schools have in the last decade just done a wonderful job, you know, doing all the new um, ventilation systems and they're, it's just really good. So that made me feel better. But the thing is, is that we want to do all of the things, but can we? I don't know the situations in all the schools. And when you have some schools that are so crowded, are we able to do all of those things? So I think it's going to be a fluid fluid thing that you're going to have to keep watching and, and checking and you know do the testing do we have the testing all set up i don't i'm not sure about all those things but we have to follow what the cdc says and even what they say changes so we'll just have to do our best thanks rhonda if you would please respond i'm just gonna i'm looking at the clock okay here we go oh wait Okay, sorry. Um, so 
the obviously the CDC guidelines is something that we are um, using and moving forward with. The millions of dollars that the CARES Act fund um, was was given to us, the CARES money has been spent on, I believe, over a million dollars in PPE. Um, there are plexiglass uh, partitions in classrooms. Um, there is a machine that sanitizes uh, classrooms as well. We actually spoke about this last night in a meeting. Um, so the district facilities has ensured us, and I have asked multiple times on record in meetings, um, are we ready? And they have said, quote unquote, we are ready to go. So the, the district itself has put a lot of time and energy and effort into that. And thankfully, again, with CARES Act money, that's been possible. Um, the contact tracers, uh, I know there was discussion about actually using CARES money to fund our own contact tracers, and I believe that would be an amazing idea. And um, I'm looking forward to being able to have a report on all of this, and that's another part of that. I'm asking the district to come back to the board and, and the public, frankly, and, and give us an update on, on what is being done, what is working, what needs um, help, and, and, and what we can improve upon. So these are all things that I know we're doing. Um, I believe there is additional CARES money out there um, that I would assume we're going to look into using if, if necessary. Okay, um, Andrew, if you would please uh, respond to the question. Sure, um, as, far as, as far as COVID safety, um, one thing I'd like to point out for sure is that um, everything that I have voted for as far as coming back has lined up very close as far as burden rates to where this where the CDC was at. I mean you're trying to decide in advance where things are going to be, but we've uh, we've always we've always been there. The CDC is now looking at a one week a one week rate. And when you look at those one week rates and when it says it's okay for um, for in person, uh, full in person at the at all grade levels, we are by the time we would be doing it, we'll be well within those guidelines. And if we're not, if COVID takes another turn, then we take another meeting, we have another look. Um, I did I did want to go back to the um, vaccine-based return date because um, I voted to reverse that. I also was the only no vote on the initial vaccine-based date. And the reason I did that is because I... I looked ahead to what a vaccine-based return date would do. I saw it fostering strife, arguments, possibly moving that goalpost perhaps multiple times. I'm glad the vaccines arrived on time and started on time. That goalpost could have moved multiple times and we immediately, immediately after that was passed, I was getting arguments from people saying, well, some teachers are over 65 and got it, that clock has started. And that's exactly what I wanted to avoid those differing interpretations. Okay. The next question, uh, we'll start with uh, Nancy. Many children, especially teenagers, are proven to achieve better with later school start times. Other than authorizing a committee study or consultant, what would you do to allow for more students to operate with natural, optimal times? So in that question, you said without having a, a committee to decide it, you mean? Okay. Yes, without having a committee, a study, or a consultant. So how would I, as a board member, do this? Okay. Yes. Well, okay. I know that Rhonda has been bringing that up several times um, in at the meetings, and I have... I know when my children were in high school, I know it was already a, a concern. And that was like um, back, you know, in 2006, like when my son graduated. But I, I don't know how I would actually just make that come about as a school board member. I mean, I would probably, I would agree with it to a certain amount, but I, I really don't know. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Rhonda, if you would please respond. Um, sure. So actually, I have brought it up because I actually had a proposal that was approved by the board about a year and a half ago um, to look into the school start times and the science and research behind it. And I was extremely happy about that because I, from what I heard, it had been 
uh, presented a few years ago and was tabled or it didn't go anywhere. So I was extremely happy that the, the board supported that endeavor. And uh, as a result of that, we had a committee task force that was um, we, we executed um, with multiple district staff, parents, a few students, and uh, a couple board members. And we met two times a month for about three hours for about eight months. So this was a very um, labor intensive, comprehensive um, approach. And we went through all the subsidiary, subsidiary issues when it would come to um, shifting a very, very large system that we have in place when it comes to school start times, but we, what we discovered is that we have it backwards in this district and that we should actually be starting the school uh, start times earlier um, for elementary and later for high school and middle school. And right now this has been put on hold. Um, the, the committee made a recommendation to the school board and we decided to, obviously as the pandemic came into play, we decided to put this on hold and then um, we'll be revisiting it. And I hope to be part of that work moving forward because I believe in it as an approach to um, teaching the whole child concept. Thank you. Andrew, if you'd please uh, respond to the question. Sure, can I hear the question again, please? Certainly. Many children, especially teenagers, are proven to achieve better with later school start times. Other than authorizing a committee, a study, or a consultant, what would you do to allow for more students to operate with natural optimal times? Thank you. Well, uh, definitely no need for uh, another study, another committee, another consultant. We, we did that. They made the recommendations. I, I understand that obviously COVID-19, when we weren't in the buildings, it was it certainly threw a wrench into things. I believe uh, right around the time we might have made the, the decision, uh, is when is when everything got turned upside down. That being said, uh, to an extent, I'm a little disappointed that we didn't at least talk about knowing that the year was going to be starting virtual. That's a that would have been a low risk way to try something new that didn't affect busing, that um, didn't affect all these other moving parts, and and we didn't. And that's why when I talk about creative solutions, when I talk about um, you know, thinking outside the box, which I think I think teachers do, and I think some buildings do. The district doesn't doesn't do that. Uh, there's the mindset seems to always be around uh, compliance and consistency. I I think we missed an opportunity here, and um, I hope going forward. I hope that next year as we return to the buildings, I think that um, that I hope that's part of the discussion because we did that work and we had the committee. Brian, if you would please respond. Yes, um, I think there's there's two key points to this. Um, we have some district, I'm sorry, some buildings in the district that have flexibility um, as far as the way that they deliver instruction and they would be able to utilize that to start a later start time. So um, I know Preble has like a zero hour, so let's look at the opportunity of extending the day a little bit later, making sure staff is open to the concept and the scheduling part of it. Um, the other key part of that is that this is a decision that can't be made just with the Green Bay School District. This would have to be um, addressed kind of like a snow day where, you know, I've, I've heard rumors that there's like a whole coalition of superintendents that meets to discuss this. And the reason is it's going to impact busing. It's going to impact extracurricular activities. It's going to impact um, job schedules within the community as far as um, the ability to get students to and from school. So. Green Bay is the large district in the area, and if we took the lead on this, this is something that all the Brown County schools could look at or all of the, the schools within the conferences could look at to make sure that we're looking at it from the big picture aspect of it. That's not just Green Bay saying, we're gonna start later and not recognizing the impact that that would have um, on athletics, ex extracurricular activities, busing, all those uh, other issues that take place. So um, I think we could be the leader on it in the area. Thank you. The next question uh, we'll first um, address to Rhonda. Um, if elected or re-elected to the Green Bay School Board, where would you look to make budget cuts and are there any areas that you would not consider cutting? Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, 
So yes, we have a very large bu a budget right now. It's almost $400 million. And from what I understand, districts um, have the opportunity to take and look at their table of organization. And that is something that I would like to see us do. Um, and, and really have somebody come in and independently do that and look at the whole um, system as a, as a whole and, and, and maybe give us some recommendations, right? These are, these are experts, these are people that are, are qualified to do this work and then maybe just give us some recommendations, some guidelines to work with. Um, I have and will continue to support budgets that are student and classroom centered. I'm supporting the, the staff in the buildings and the um, really as close to the students as possible. Um, that's my non-negotiable as far as making budget cuts. Um, when we go outside of that, um, it is a fact that our last superintendent increased her administrative budget 74% in her tenure. And I think that we should start right there. And that is something that um, isn't always a popular opinion, but um, if you want to really and truly support students and teachers in the classroom, um, that is absolutely where I would begin. Okay, um, Andrew, if you'd please take that question. So one thing that's important is to do do right by the people that are involved if there's if there's budget cuts and as um, as some some people know, but maybe uh, I mean everyone here knows, but not everyone knows. Uh, there's not a lot of local control um, over your budget or, or um, how much of a pie that there is. I do think it's important if you're facing some uh, revenue loss due to, for example, declining enrollment. Usually, we we've always been able to do right by people, and retirements have been able to to smooth out. Um, smooth things out and at least avoid uh, you know job loss and layoffs and I think that we can probably continue to avoid that if our budget doesn't keep up with inflation due to declining enrollment um, that being said I think the dollars do need to be the dollars do need to be close to the kids that's teachers that's uh, paras that's support personnel in the buildings um, I Certainly don't uh, don't think and it would be hard pressed to support in a declining budget situation um, not having some administrative reductions as part of the part of the puzzle. Um, again, doing it right, doing it through retirements. Uh, that's not a situation we're in right now, but if we're in it, uh, that's that's how I would how I would look at things. Okay, um, Brian, if you would please respond to the question. Yes, I, I agree. I think that budget decisions need to be student centered and making sure that we have um, the most qualified educators in front of the students that we can. And if we need to adjust um, as far as a top heavy budget, then we do that. But the other part of the puzzle is that we need to increase funding for the school district, um, limiting open enrollment, making sure that we're keeping the students that are Green Bay Area school district students attending school in the in the district where they live um, the other thing is we need to address the current funding formula there's revenue limits um, there's no minimum funding per student and the reliance on property taxes i'm sorry on property wealth um, i would also advocate that we change the we advocate for the state to change the funding formula from instead of a three-year average for enrollment to a five-year average that would eliminate some of the peaks and valleys that we'd see especially in in a in a COVID year of enrollment hits and would make it easier for student, I'm sorry, for school districts to budget. Um, yeah, we need to make sure that the state is funding special education students at the two thirds that they promised and that the federal government's fully funding title money that they they promised to fund students. So I would look at two, two approaches, advocating for full funding of public schools and then making sure if we do have any budget cuts that we focus on uh, student-centered activities and uh, the people that are directly in front of the students on there. So thank you. Okay. Nancy, if you would please respond. Okay, probably right now is really a good time after this terrible year to think about doing a strategic planning exercise. Our lives outside of school have changed as well as our lives in school. And we have to figure out before we go start cutting anything, what, what has happened this last year. And we have to take the best things about this, like 
all of the new computers, the hotspots and things like that. Figure out how that is going to help us and um, figure out what's not going to help us. Figure that all out. Then we make changes for the future. But when we're doing that, if we put people, all our staff and our support staff, if we let them have the input and we empower them and we reward them for the improvements they can make, the dollars that they can save us, and they can, they know what works, they know how to cut some corners, do all of that, then, then, I lost my train of thought, then do the strategic planning and, and, I'm sorry, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. The, the next question um, is related to school safety, and we'll start with Andrew. What precautions are you in favor of when it comes to preventing violence in schools, and do you feel that the schools have a right to monitor social media to check on their students' postings to watch out for potential problems? I uh, think yeah, school school safety is uh, certainly very important. It was the it was the key, probably the key issue a couple of years ago when there was a lot of discussion about um, about armed security in the the schools and the board didn't think we needed to increase beyond the current um, SRO program, school resource officer. I think we need to look at the the school resource officer program and where it fits into the puzzle. But also, what are we doing as far as diffusing tension? And that's where some of the comments from my fellow candidates have been about uh, you know, restorative justice, about best practices, about making people feel welcome in the classroom. Are we having, you know, we, we certainly have in the past had situations where dress code incidents were escalated all the way to the all the way to the police, and that's wrong. And it's it's terrible on a whole lot of levels and there's unintended consequences. I think the welcoming school environment is the is the number one thing that can keep things safe. Um, our as far as our schools, our school staff is is busy enough without uh, being asked to monitor uh, social media happening outside of the outside of the school day, and I don't think it's appropriate to be doing that. Uh, certainly, when there is a safety threat that's discovered on social media, we can and do take appropriate follow up from that. But um, that's we're not in the business of monitoring people's private communication or, or personal communication outside of school hours. Brian, if you would please respond to the question. Yes, um, I think there's several areas that we can work on to make sure that students feel safe in the building. Uh, the first one is making sure that we are adequately staffed. Uh, the majority of times, students, if they can make a connection with a staff member, they're going to feel safe. They're going to be able to make those connections and and have a trusted adult working with them. And it doesn't necessarily need to be an educator. It could be um, after school programming. It could be um, making sure that we have consistent staffing in the in the lunchroom, so food service and facility staff. So there's a trusted adult for that student to contact. Um, as far as training for the staff, I believe every staff member should be taught uh, response, I'm sorry, nonviolent crisis intervention and uh, traumatic care. So staff members are knowing how to respond to students that are in crisis and that have experienced trauma. Uh, I have a unique position as far as the school resource officer. I've, I'm, I work closely with the school resource officer in every school that I've been in. And I think that there should be a memorandum of understanding with the district that School resource officers shouldn't be utilized necessarily to break up fights and discipline issues. That if there's something that's happening in the school that requires an officer, they should call one in off of the street. There should be a patrol officer that comes in so students can continue to make those connections with the school resource officer in a positive setting. Um, obviously in a severe crisis, we're gonna trust that the officer is working, but making sure that we utilize the school resource officer as they're truly intended to be. So thank you. Nancy, if you'd please uh, take the question. Okay. Children need to go to school and they need to feel safe. And the way to do that is to make sure your environment in your classroom is friendly, welcoming, and that the child can be successful there. It's important to teach 
students how how to interact with each other. And as a teacher, I went to numerous programs and the this, this STEP program just comes to mind right now where you take children and you show them how to interact if they're being bullied, the steps to do that, what, you know, you teach them how to interact with each other, you teach them how not to do put downs, all of those things. We've been trained in a million different ways. And what we need to do is we need to, as adults, model it. We need to make them know that safety is coming from us too, that we, <laughs> that, oh, I keep losing my train of thought. Just to teach them to be well behaved and to maintain. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's too much a little bit, sorry. <laughs> Okay, would you, all right, we'll, we'll move, move on. Uh, Rhonda, would you please respond? Um, this is a really important question and consideration. I think we're going to see a lot of um, kids, we know there are a lot of kids, students in crisis right now, and moving forward into the next uh, year or so of, of school, I think these are all really important things to consider and commit to as a board. Um, and that would start with the budget, right? It's a student-centered budget. and. Uh, looking at it through a whole child approach. And then when I say that, I think about the sleep um, deprivation um, when it comes to school start times. Also, making sure there is <clears throat> adequate trauma-informed care support for students. Um, the restorative practices when it comes to discipline in the classroom and building relationships. Um, class sizes makes a very big difference in this, in this situation and the makeup of, of classes as well. Um, social workers and counselors, um, you know, let's see what we can do with some additional CARES Act money moving forward. Um, engaging classroom experiences, um, offering options, continuing to offer options for students um, such as NEW School of Innovation and John Dewey for kids that don't necessarily fit into a, a normal um, classroom structure. Um, these are things that I believe we need to look at as well as maybe creating more robust wellness policies. Let's make sure we um, continue to get movement breaks for secondary students and add more recess options um, for elementary students. So just really understanding why kids misbehave, what we can do to be proactive about that. Okay. The next question, um, we'll start with uh, Brian. What are the most productive ways for the Board of Education to communicate with the public, including parents? Um, I think that responding to emails, which the, the, I've heard fantastic things from all of the board members, um, responding to constituent concerns on there, um, making sure that the board meetings are productive and that questions are being answered, but in, a, in an organized way. So I believe it's a board policy that there's Robert's rules being followed and making sure that the, that's taking place. So um, people will be able to attend a board meeting and watch and get the information that they were told was going to be discussed and will continue to be discussed. Um, and just, just in an orderly fashion with that, making sure that board members are visible in all of the buildings that they can, um, the ones they're assigned to, and if they can, if they can go watch their kids and they're playing basketball someplace, making sure that they're, they're known as a board member in the area. Um, and then having, having office hours or having time that you can focus on, um, like the principal's coffee hours um, where you can go and say, okay, I'm going to meet with the elementary schools in the Southwest Quadrant on this day, come and join me. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in the school itself. Some parents are not comfortable coming back into a school. They didn't have the best educational experience and, and they're concerned with that. So I think embracing the community schools model that I spoke of before gives us that opportunity, but making sure that we're, we're available and accessible to, this, uh, to the community members. Nancy, if you'd please uh, take the question. Okay, everything that Brian said is true. And I just want you to know that as, as a teacher, I, whenever I reached out to a board member, they right away got back to me and we did go to do some coffee chats and things like that. So I think that's it. And, and being in the schools is truly important in a, in a non-threatening way, but in a helpful way, like you're not, you know, oh, the school board's coming. No, it should be, they're your friend. Just like, like the SRO is, they're gonna be your friend. We should be that way as well. Thanks. 
Okay, Rhonda, if you'd please take the question. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Certainly. Thank you. Um, what are the most productive ways for the Board of Education to communicate with the public, including parents? Uh, I, I think the first thing we need to think about is what do they need, right? So what is something that, that parents are using to communicate themselves? Um, from what I hear on a regular basis, obviously email is something that we have. It's public record. Um, it's what we use for our board um, communication. But a lot of uh, families want to be able to engage on social media. And that is something that they, they desire and that they actually really appreciate. And I personally have never left that platform. Um, there are board members who run for office. They create a social media presence and then they disappear. I have never done that. As a matter of fact, I continue to post board agendas. I ask for feedback. Um, I've been pretty um, happy about the, the discussions that end up happening. I know people are typically afraid of what goes on, but for the most part, even when people disagree, um, what I love is that they bring ideas and they and they keep us in check and they keep us accountable. And that's another um, thing that I think is, is important about that. Um, also, be available because this job is not on your terms, right? You need to be accessible and available. Um, I take phone calls all week, Monday through Sunday, um, all times of day. Um, it's something that uh, people expect out of their elected officials, and I'm more than happy to do that. Andrew, if you'd please uh, respond. Uh, thank you. So I think it, one one important thing that board members can do, uh, among the other important things that were mentioned here, and to the extent that to the extent that members can, and between seven board members, you couldn't cover all of the need for it. But as as an elected official, we have a a unique role for advocacy. And sometimes when um, sometimes when we get a call um, about something, we need to help someone dive into an issue. And there are there are people who don't like that. There are people who call that um, call that micromanaging to look into an issue. But the the fact is, that's what elected officials do. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't ever tolerate a an, a city council person uh, when you said your garbage didn't get picked up. Oh, I'll run it by you know administration. Thanks thanks for your call. That's why you need a you need to be a a hands-on board and taking that that hands-on approach sometimes means walking with uh, someone through through a problem or issue. I think streamlining the chain of communication, which I insisted on, uh, because there were things where there was a complaint process with with six steps that took a whole year to get through if all the time was used. That's not that's not uh, that's not community friendly. Uh, I voted no on the uh, repurposing of Jefferson because the communication was not there in my opinion in such a way as to give people a fair opportunity to respond to what was really going on at the school. Uh, as you speak, top-down <clears throat> language, decisions that seem to be made already before the input was solicited. We need to we need to stay away from those practices and uh, be authentic, be upfront, and uh, involve not just involved, but involved meaningfully, uh, community members, uh, teachers, staff, students, and processes. Thank you. Okay. The next question, uh, we will start with Nancy. Should families be given the option to have their children continue with virtual learning in the fall and throughout the 2021-2022 school year? And they would just be part of the Green Bay School District, correct? If they're being virtual? I guess that would that be up you to you to respond to. Like, okay, so you're saying that if they choose to be in, in virtual, Green Bay Public Schools would provide that for them, like they're providing it this year? I, I believe that the question relates to whether or not as a board you would support the virtual learning next year, if that's what a family wanted to do. Yes, I would, because I 
the reading that I've done is that virtual learning isn't bad for all kids. I have read that kids with attention deficit disorder and things like that actually do better without the noise in the classroom. Kids that were struggling and were failing are now, uh, you know, doing so much better. So there are many people, I thought it was 33%, but now Rhonda's saying that like it's 25% are want to stay virtual or are virtual. And I think, you know, why don't they get an option too? I would, I would go with that. Thank you. Okay. Rhonda, if you'd please respond. Um, my answer is yes, with an exclamation point. And the reason that I feel that way is because when you look at virtual schools, or charter schools, especially public charter schools that are virtual, the, the setup is not the same, right? You don't have the same screen time requirements. You have a very different format when it comes to engagement. Um, what we have in place, and we didn't have much time to prepare for that, and that is not the fault of any staff member or teacher, right? That's just that's just the truth. Um, it is not the same uh, format and approach. So I'm hopeful that we do provide something for students who do have an interest in this. We do actually already have uh, at the secondary level at John Dewey Academy, we have an online program. But again, they follow sleep research, they start later, and they don't, it's not the same format as what is in place in Green Bay right now. So it's an entirely different thing. We do not have anything at the elementary level, and I, I believe and I'm hopeful that we will be considering something like that in, um, in the future. So my answer is yes to that, but it's, I need to be very clear. It is a very different format when it comes to virtual schools and what they um, facilitate. and um, I have been hearing rumblings that we're looking into doing that, and I am hopeful that we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew, if you would please respond. So I, I definitely, um, and I'm, I'm assuming the question assumes that we're looking ahead to a long-term post-COVID um, post situation. So uh, we're in an emergency mode of, of virtual learning where we're doing the best we can with what we have, where there's a lot of people um, involuntarily on a reduced schedule to at least some, some extent. Um, Rhonda is absolutely correct that when you do um, when you do planned scheduled virtual learning like we do in the in the program attached the the public program attached to the John Dewey uh, public charter school um, there are things that are done done differently it's it's optimized for for kids and one really great thing about it is there are definitely kids who start in the John Dewey Academy um, online program and many times they'll come into the building for an event and then they'll check out another event and they may not necessarily end up be switching completely over to full day attenders but they get more they get involved they get um, they become part of the um, part of the life of the school part of the the community um, and they can stay online and be part of that as well I think um, we were really held back by the state resisting uh, schools doing more with online. And I think that a uh, wall has been broken down and it's time for us to, to take a stand and offer that to those who want it. Okay. Brian, if you would please uh, respond to the question. Absolutely. I, I agree with what's been said. I think that students should have that opportunity. Um, I agree with what had been spoken of before. Um, we, Educators in general and, and the community as a whole struggled a year ago because it's something that we had not experienced. And as the numbers show, you know, I, I heard about a third of the students are choosing to remain virtual for, for many reasons. We need to find out why they're choosing to remain virtual. Is it something they're interested in? We got to make sure we're promoting the programs that we have. We have John Dewey Academy. We have, um, last time I checked, we have over 60 courses that are offered online through the district already. And this is also an opportunity for us to take students from other districts and use use the the bulk of Green Bay that we have where we can offer more languages, we can offer more opportunities and start trying to get students to enroll in our online program if we, if we choose to go with that. But yeah, absolutely, I believe we should um, offer and continue to expand it. Um, online learning and virtual learning is, is something that can be done well and 
we, we, we have the opportunity. We have the students, we have excellent staff, and now we've got some experience behind us to do so. Okay, uh, that ends um, our questions. And now according to my clock, uh, it is 7.53, so I'd like to begin um, with the um, candidates' closing statements. And we'll start with Nancy uh, for your two minute closing statement. Again, I would like to thank the League and those watching for allowing me to share my vision for how I can contribute to the education of our children and the future of the Green Bay Public Schools. My connection to the pa and passion to the, for education and Green Bay Schools is very personal and goes back to childhood. While serving in the Navy, my father was severely injured and died of a heart attack at the age of 33. My mom became a widow with five children under the age of 10. I was seven and I remember how difficult it was to be one of only a few single parent families. When I was 10, I finally started to feel a real connection to school because of my teacher, Nancy Preston. She made a point of drawing me out and encouraging me. Looking back, I know that she did more than teach me. She inspired my joy of learning and more. My three grown children are graduates of Green Bay Schools and are successful because of the selfless and dedicated people in the Green Bay Schools. My husband and I are so grateful for all of them. Finally, my career as an educator has been one of my greatest joys. I am thankful to have had the opportunity to share my joy of learning with my students and my passion for teaching with my colleagues. This is why I love Green Bay Area Public Schools and why I want every student and staff member to feel the same. I may be a retired grandma of eight, but in this time and in this place, I believe my expertise and experience can make a difference. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. It's time to take a deep breath and work together, civilly and respectfully, to inspire a joy of learning. To learn more about me, visit my page, at, follow me on Facebook, and please vote for Nancy Welch on April 6th. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, if you would please offer your um, closing statements. Thank you. Uh, I also would like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting the event tonight, um, my fellow candidates for participating, the community members for attending. Um, I have my master's degree in educational leadership. I've been a teacher for 17 years. I have been heavily involved in our community through things I've spoken of before, officiating, organizing chess tournaments, um, and just I've been involved in our community for quite some time. Um, one thing that I think sets me apart from the other candidates is I have a network of educators that I can reach and talk to. Um, issues impacting Green Bay aren't necessarily issues that impact our neighboring districts. We need to make sure that we can collaborate with um, other school districts of the same size, whether they're urban education groups or um, mid mid-sized city groups that we can reach out to and i have that network i have it through my years of experience teaching i have it through my involvement um, with the new york times learning network i have it through just normal networking that's taken place um, i'm running for school board because i believe that the green bay area public school district is doing great things and we need to continue to promote that i believe every student should be able to learn in a safe environment and that every staff member should be able to work in one I know that we're facing serious challenges and I feel that I have the experience and policy background to lead us forward. Um, you can find out more about my campaign at votemills.org. It's M-I-L-Z, I've been saying it my whole life that way. And my Facebook page, facebook.com, votemills. You can reach me at brian at votemills.org. Uh, I hope that the members of the community here will join over 500 educators that have supported my campaign, as well as community leaders, Green Bay Area Public School families, and recognizing my experience in education. I'm doing this because I think that we have great things. I'm doing this because I have skin in the game. My kids are students in the Green Bay Area Public School District, and I wanna make sure they have the best environment to learn in. Please continue to uh, support our campaign, and I hope that you vote for the candidates you support on April 6th, and that I'm one of them. Thank you. Andrew, if you'd please offer your closing um, statement. Yes, uh, thank you again to the to the League for the opportunity to, to have this forum again under these um, under these challenging circumstances. I think the if you look at uh, you know you look at a forum tonight where people were on the same page with many um, many issues. I think we're all 
um, community first, kids first um, candidates. Sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes there's a different um, a candidate with a different agenda. Uh, so it becomes harder to separate the the candidates. And I think the thing that you need to know about me is is hands-on leadership and institutional knowledge. Um, knowing what's happened in the district over the course um, from the inside, from the board perspective over the course of many years is important because what ch changes things and what makes a difference is often not the things that happen in a vote at the board table. It's the things that quietly come up or become a rule or a practice or disappear as a rule or a practice, which is why I've uh, clearly said, though I've I've participated in head nodding around the table before, I don't anymore. If we head nod at the table, it, it doesn't count. Motions count, board policies count. And some people don't like board policies. They say it's a it's a trust issue if board members are proposing a policy. It's not, it's about, it's about doing things right. And I am someone who's always voted independently. I've, uh, I listen to administration, I listen to the public. I have the best track record of, of any board member of how often I voted independently from the administration. And I look forward to continuing that uh, for, for the next three years. Um, any candidate here, I'd be more than happy to serve with in a, in a different year, but this is a year that I think my experience is needed. Uh, please visit votebecker.us, follow me on Facebook, or uh, vote Becker at gmail.com. Thank you. Rhonda, if you'd please offer your closing uh, statement. Thank you. Um, thanks again to the League of Women Voters for hosting the forum and for those of you who understand the importance of school board governance. As it was stated many times this evening, it is very clear how critical public schools are for the health and well being of the communities they serve. How have I demonstrated my understanding of this and what will I continue to do? I have and will continue to support school budgets and expenditures that are student and classroom centered as mentioned before. Um, the pandemic economy will not be kind to public school budgets, so I believe it's time to critically evaluate our priorities and adjust accordingly. I understand that the school board should work for the public's trust. Transparency has and will continue to be a staple of my board service. As a parent, I'm personally navigating the public school system along with you. And as an individual who's self-employed, I know the importance of not just working hard, but working efficiently. Um, I believe I'm unique in this uh, position. I am not an educator, but I am a licensed cosmetologist, and why does that matter? Um, I spend hours every, every week with the general public. I can tell you what your mail person, your barista from a local coffee shop, uh, your oh, corporate wow. business person. I my lights on. Um, a local musician, a single parent with kids in the district, I can tell you exactly how these people feel about the decisions that the school board makes. And I believe I have the temperature of many in the community because of this. And I believe when you're making decisions for uh, 18,000 students is actually the number at this point, um, 3,000 employees plus and eight municipalities of constituency, um, I believe that um, my my role and my profession um, brings great insight into this position. Um, but basically, number one um, job that I have is to be a voice for the community, and I hope to continue to be able to do that. And I am asking for your vote on April 6th. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to Rhonda Sidnikow, Brian Mills, Nancy Welch, and Andrew Becker for participating in this virtual forum and sharing your perspectives and positions. And thank you to our audience participating virtually for submitting your thoughtful questions. I'd like to also extend our appreciation to League Board Member Karen Schley for coordinating this forum and League Member Steve Harrell for the technical work set up to record this forum. As a reminder, the recording of this forum is available on the League of Women Voters Greater Green Bay Facebook page and website. You can register to vote online or by mail in Wisconsin and the deadline is March 17th. To register in person in your city, village or town clerk's office, the deadline is April 2nd. Wisconsin also allows voter registration at the polls on election day. 
In closing, I'd like to remind everybody to please remember to vote by absentee or in person on the polls by Tuesday, April 6th. This ends our school board forum brought to you by the League of Women Voters, Greater Green Bay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>